uh, hell is not a subject that Christians like to think about. Uh, in fact, uh, somebody was just telling me this a couple of days ago that there are several churches even in the area that uh, have very stridently avoided this particular topic because it might not sit well with the congregation, okay? And that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, one of the, probably one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, said uh, if there was any one doctrine he could remove from the Christian uh, you know, spectrum of doctrines, this would be that. It would be the doctrine of hell because it is such a terrible, terrible reality. Uh, you know, and we, 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 we talk about the gospel a lot here at Cornerstone. We, uh, I, I think it's important to talk about the gospel a lot, but I've also been reading a lot of, uh, seeing a lot of data and articles on uh, why Christians for, uh, in different parts of the world are actually sort of apathetic about the gospel. Um, and it kind of got me thinking about why that was the case. And I think, I think one of the reasons is we don't talk enough about hell. And so here's why. I think uh, if you can write this down, this is important to know. We will never understand the significance of the good news unless we first realize the magnitude of the bad news. And I think it's important to, we, we talk about the gospel all the time, the good news, the gospel means the good news, yes. But you won't understand its value until you understand why it's good news. Why is it good? Good as compared to what? And unless we really focus on what the bad news is, we won't understand the significance of the gospel. So what is the bad news? The bad news is that all have fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. We are all sinners. And God's law states that the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. Nobody is exempt from that. So technically speaking, kind of like what Sean said, hell is not a place for bad people. Hell is all of our default destination, if not for the saving grace of God. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a default destination for all of us, if not for the gracious and loving and merciful intervention of God. So some of us here might be sitting here thinking, well, okay, why, why does this matter to me? I'm saved. Uh, well, the straightforward response is it should matter to us because the scriptures show that it matters to God. Okay? Scriptures tell us that God desires that no one should perish, that all be saved. And for some of us, there might be a loved one, a son, daughter, a friend, some family member, who is, as much as I hate to say it, probably currently on their way to hell. And that should be a sobering reality for us. One of my professors once said, every day he woke up with a burden, and that burden was, today, somebody somewhere in the world is going to be eternally separated from God. <clears throat> and that should break our heart. So look, I, I understand that this is a sort of a difficult topic to talk about. There may be people in here who have uh, kind of varying views on it, uh, and that's okay. We, we're going to talk about some of those uh, variables. We'll do our best to cover everything as much as we can. Like I said, this is a pretty huge topic, so uh, we're going we're gonna to try to clip along as, as quickly as possible. But the one thing we cannot do is be indifferent about the issue of hell. Because our Lord Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Jesus paid more attention to the bad news than he talked about the good news. Okay, So not only does Jesus reference hell, he describes it in great detail as well. And we're going to explore these passages tonight. I think it's important that we understand straight from the words, straight from the mouth of Jesus, what hell is before we start uh, looking into some of the other philosophical aspects of it. So, so here's the format for tonight. Uh, I'm actually going to kind of break down the passages. We're going to look at a lot of passages uh, that specifically talk about hell. There's scores of passages, but I've tried to narrow it down to some of the clearest ones, um, and that will kind of give us where the Bible stands on the doctrine of hell. And then I'm going to show you some alternative views of hell. Okay, there are <laughs> other Christians even who have different <coughs> views on hell, and they use scripture to support those views. So I'm going to walk you through what those alternative views are, 
We're going to look at the proof text that they use, and I'm going to show you why that's not the correct interpretation of that text, and why that is, uh, historically, why the, the church has not considered that as the correct orthodox view of hell. And then finally, we're going to come back to the biblical view of hell, and I'm going to show you some, uh, we're going to talk about possibly some philosophical objections that people may have uh, about that particular doctrine. The Bible teaches the doctrine of hell as eternal conscious punishment, ECP, if you want to call it that, eternal conscious punishment. So we're going to look at, of course, why there is punishment. We're going to look at why punishment is going to be conscious. And finally, the most difficult question of all, why punishment is going to be eternal. Okay, so we will examine all of those things in great detail. <clears throat> but uh, before, we, before we get into that, I just want to get rid of a, a false picture in our minds. I think when people think of uh, God consigning people to hell, there's kind of this image in our minds where God is just mercilessly dragging some poor innocent person by their hair as they're kicking and screaming and pleading with God to let him go. And God just nonchalantly just throws him over the edge of a cliff. And this person goes plummeting down into a fury abyss, screaming in agony. That is a false picture. That is not the picture that the Bible paints. The Bible, like just like Sean said, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis said in his uh, in his book, I believe, Mere Christianity. Uh, sorry, not Mere Christianity. The problem of pain. He says that the door to hell is locked from the inside. What does that mean? What that means is that the people who eventually end up in hell are there by virtue of their own choice. So what that means is that the, the more accurate picture is people marching toward the edge of a cliff like lemmings. They don't even know what they're going over. And there's God on the sidelines standing with his arms open, waiting for us to be saved. And we continue to walk past him, seeking our own autonomy. I think that picture is a more accurate picture of what is actually happening. And I think the reason why we have a, a, a wrong view of hell is because of, number one, we have a lopsided view of God's nature. If you think of God as just a giant teddy bear in the sky, that God is only loving, he's only merciful, he's only kind, then you're missing out on several other attributes of God that are just as important. God's justice, God's holiness, God's righteousness. We cannot afford to overlook all of that. But the second reason also why we have a wrong picture is because we trivialize sin. We trivialize sin. And we cannot do that. All right, so let's get into the biblical teaching on hell. There's obviously scores of passages we can go to, but for the sake of time, I've just narrowed down to nine verses that I want to uh, show you that I think speaks very clearly to this doctrine, all right? So, <clears throat> first of all, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worm that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will become loathsome to all mankind. Next, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 to 9. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25. This is a very, very important verse uh, straight from the mouth of Jesus. <clears throat> then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. <laughs> Jude chapter 7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah, 
and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Jude chapter 13, they are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 to 11, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 14, 10 to 11, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. And finally, Revelation chapter 20, verses 10, and then 14 to 15, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Those are sobering words. Those are sobering words. <clears throat> so what are some facets of hell that are obvious from these passages? Okay, now again, like I said, there, there are scores of passages that we could have looked at, but we're focused on just nine. So just from these nine verses, the Bible seems to give us a very clear indication of some of the characteristics of hell. We're going to look at some of those characteristics now, okay? Number one, we're looking at unquenchable fire. This signifies heat, destruction, loss, agony, wrath. There's a, a, a reference to worms. And here I think worms actually refer, uh, is a reference to maggots because it signifies death. And not just dead, but the dying because it says the worms will not die. Okay, so it's a continuing process. Talks about shame and contempt and guilt, which shows us that there will be no relief from the negative vices of human nature. That is, I think one of that's probably going to be one of the worst characteristics of hell is that, you know, here we have we even the scripture says that the grace of God shines, the, the, the sun shines upon the wicked even, and the rain is even for the it's called common grace, right? The doctrine of common grace. Even common grace will not be available in hell. And for those people who consciously chose uh, a reality apart from God will continue to live with that guilt and regret and remorse um, for eternity. Another feature is there will be a separation from God forever. There's no benefit of common grace, like we said. They are cast into the blackest darkness. And actually, in some, some theologians will call this the outer darkness. Okay, there's, there's the darkness, and then there's the outer darkness where there's no remnant of light at all, not even in the distance. And then, of course, the word torment. There is burning sulfur where the smoke will rise forever. And then finally, there's no rest day or night forever and ever. Look, uh, these adjectives and descriptions are used intentionally uh, to portray the awful reality and the horror of the nature of hell. Hell is a terrible existence. And what we see in Matthew 25, where Jesus says, into, into the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. What does that tell us? That actually tells us that hell was not part of God's plan for human beings. Human beings were not supposed to go to hell. That was not part of the plan. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. But, but, you can also consider hell like a cosmic trash can. Jesus was very clear. He was very black and white. You are either with me or you are against me. You either go into eternal life in heaven or eternal damnation. So there is no happy medium. There is no... There is no waiting lounge somewhere in the middle. You can't say, 
well, I don't want to be in heaven with God, but the hell seems pretty bad too. Is there any other option? There is no option C. Okay? Jesus was very clear about our spiritual allegiance. And those who are with him will be rewarded with eternal life in heaven. And those who choose against him will be punished with eternal destruction in hell. In summary, the name of as I mentioned before, the biblical doctrine of hell is called eternal conscious punishment. Punishment signifying uh, the excruciating nature of suffering that will take place. Conscious signifying the fact that the wicked will be aware of everything that they are experiencing. And eternal, lastly, that all these experiences will go on forever. Okay, we will we'll philosophically unpack some of these toward the end, um, but that is essentially what the Bible teaches about the doctrine of hell. Okay, is that clear? Any, any questions about that so far? I know there's going to be lots of questions. We'll, we'll try to get to that in a little bit, but I want to actually segue into some of these alternative views of hell if, uh, if there are no questions so far. Roger. Is uh, the word hell, should it be capitalized all the time? Or, or like you would... Um, I don't. I don't think it. I don't think it matters. Okay. Yeah. I don't, for practical purposes, I don't think it matters. Okay. Um, okay. So that is that is the biblical doctrine of hell. Okay. Like I said, we want to take this very seriously because Jesus took it seriously. Some of the most fiery words of hell came from the mouth of our own Lord Jesus, and because He took it seriously, we also need to take it seriously. All right. So now. Here's the thing, it actually turns out that there are alternative views of the doctrine of hell. There are actually uh, other Christians who think that um, th there are slight distinctions in the doctrine of hell as they see it from certain scriptures. And I'm going to show you some of those scriptures as well. Um, and the first alternative view is called universalism. Okay? Universalism is the doctrine that asserts that all men will be saved and reconciled to God. How many of you have heard of this view before? Universalism, the view that all men will be saved and reconciled to God. What does that mean? That actually means that in their opinion, they think hell will be empty. There will be no humans there, according to one particular version. So the way this works is universalists will claim that practically this can play out in uh, possibly a few different ways. The first way is this, okay? Uh, after your physical death, there is a secondary offer of salvation. All right, so after you die, um, there will be a secondary offer of salvation made to you, and God's love will be so powerful and so gracious that you will choose God post-mortem. That even though you didn't choose God in this life, after you die, when that secondary act of salvation is offered to you, then that offer is going to be so magnificent that, that people will choose God then. But even if they don't, they will at least recognize the magnificence of God, and because for that recognition, they will be saved, either voluntarily or involuntarily. All right? That's one way it could play out. The second way is that the wicked may endure a temporary period in hell where they will pay for their sins for a little bit and then they will be reconciled to God and have eternal life. So it's sort of, this is sort of like the Catholic version of purgatory. How many of you know what purgatory is? Like this, this whole view that essentially Catholicism teaches that uh, purgatory is a temporary state where there will be a purging of all of your sins uh, from your soul, and then it is kind of, it is actually sort of a preparation for the next stage, which is heaven. So actually, if, if you find yourself in purgatory, that is technically good news, because that means you're being purged and being prepared for the next stage. Okay, so these are two particular variations. Uh, not all universalists believe the same thing. Some universalists believe that um, you will have that second option of salvation post-mortem after you die. And others think that uh, the wicked, even though they rebel and reject Jesus, they will suffer for a small period of time in hell, 
and then they will move on into heaven. Now this view was first proposed by a very unorthodox church father called Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, back in the third century. Origen and his doctrine of universalism was condemned as unorthodox by the Council of Constantinople in 553 AD. After its condemnation, this view largely disappeared from, uh, from, from the landscape for a very long time. And, uh, but now it's making a comeback. Universalism is making a comeback in our culture again, which is not surprising given that our culture is so all-inclusive and all-embracing of all kinds of uh, lifestyles or views, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and so uh, universalism is coming back in a fury, all right? Uh, there are governing <laughs> denominations like the Universalist Church of America and the Unitarian Universalist Churches that teach one form of universalism or the other. Uh, even though there's no specific denomination that is based on universalism, okay? So, what is the basis? What's the basis for the doctrine of universalism? Why? Why even have this kind of view? Well, here's why. <clears throat> they think that eternal punishment in hell is inconsistent with the loving nature of God. That a loving God would not consign his creatures to such suffering. Okay. Secondly, they will argue that God is powerful enough to restore all of fallen humanity. And the implication being that if some human beings end up in hell, that proves that God was unable to save them. So it's kind of an indictment on God's omnipotence. Okay, are you guys tracking with me? That's their argument. Their argument is, if there is a blackness somewhere in the universe, if there is a one corner of the universe where there is a hell and where there are human beings that have ended up there, that means God's mighty arm was apparently not mighty enough to save them all. And so, their defense, they actually, they actually think they're, they're defending God. Okay, so their defense of God is, no, no, this could not be. God is not weak. God is not impotent. God is powerful. And so if God says that he desires all to be saved, he is able to bring about his desires. You guys tracking that argument? If, he's, if he desires that all be saved, then he is able to bring about his desires, and he is able to save all, and he does in fact save all, and that is how... Uh, they come to the doctrine of universalism. <clears throat> so, let's look at some of the... I know you guys are waiting to unpack the problems with that. We'll get to that. But I want to show you some of the, uh, the, the scriptures that they use to defend that position, okay? Here's the first one. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what I was telling you about. They think that if God wants everyone to come to repentance, then he is able to bring everyone to repentance, and he in fact does that. The second passage is Romans chapter 5, verses 19. <clears throat> For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. This I think is a little bit more of, I think the problem here is more obvious. The passage nowhere says all will be made righteous. It says many will be made righteous. But they, they, they tend to take it that way. They says, well, many may, will be made righteous basically means all. I don't even know how they get to that, but that's the conclusion they come to. Um, third verse, Acts chapter 3, verses 21. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through <coughs> his holy prophets. And when they say restore everything, they think that everything means everyone as well. Okay? Again, like I said, <clears throat> uh, even with this particular issue, there are many passages that we can go to that universalists use to support and defend their position. But I just wanted to show you some of the three, the three strongest ones that they tend to default to every time. So, here's the thing. How do we give a counter-response to this, okay? 
we have to think about a counter response. Last week, we studied hermeneutics. And you'll remember we talked about the importance of taking scriptures and context. We talked about how sometimes if there are certain passages that are not clear, that are sort of obscure passages, it is important for us to look at other passages that are clearer about that particular issue. You remember we, we talked about this last time. And we said we use the clear passages to help us understand some of the obscure passages. So this is one of those examples where we need to practice some good hermeneutics to help us navigate uh, this misinterpretation. Okay, so let's look at Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 16, right? One of the, probably the most famous Bible verse, For God so loved the world, for whosoever believes in him <clears throat> shall not perish, but have eternal life. What is the conditional word there? There's a conditional word. The conditional word is whosoever. What does that mean? <clears throat> that is not an absolute statement. So the universalists want to say, God is going to restore everyone. <clears throat> All will be saved. But whosoever is a conditional term. It says, whoever puts their trust in Christ will be saved. What is that? What's the implication? Whoever does not will not be saved. It's not an absolute all-inclusive term. Do you guys see that? So whosoever is a conditional term. Similarly, Romans chapter 10, verses 19, it says, If you confess with your mouth, you guys remember that verse, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. What is the conditional word? If. It's right there. It's right at the beginning of the sentence. If you confess with your mouth. If you don't, then what happens? If you don't believe, what happens? Then that doesn't apply to you. You see how it's, it's not just a blanket uh, judgment. It's not a blanket approval for everybody. It is conditional upon our response. The Romans passage also says that many, <clears throat> that many will be made righteous. It does not say that all will be made righteous. Okay, we already talked about that. So one of the things you will notice when you start talking to universalists is they will tend to use very absolute language. They will tend to use very uh, all-inclusive kind of language, and they like to gravitate toward those kind of verses to make their arguments. All right, but it's important for us to show them some of these other scriptures as well and say. No, God, there's no place where God just blanket approves everybody. Your entry into heaven, your eternal life is conditional upon your acceptance of what was done on the cross. <clears throat> but universalists will tell you, even if you did not accept in this life, God will dazzle you with his grace and love in the afterlife, and you will choose him, even after your death. You know, uh, ironically, it's incredible to me how the Universalists completely missed the whole book of Romans. The entire book of Romans is precisely that, that no one is righteous. It, it's a magna carta of that, whole, of that whole proposition that no human being is righteous. The entire book of Paul is completely unpacking justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. Sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christos. In Christ, in grace, in faith, through Christ alone. Okay, it is very, very conditional. So it is amazing to me how you can read the whole book of Romans and then get stuck on one particular verse and then misinterpret that verse. This is the danger of taking scripture out of context. You guys will remember we talked about this last week. If you take scriptures out of context, then this, will, this is what will happen. You will start to build an entire theology, build an entire doctrine on one verse, and then you get into all kinds of doctrinal trouble. All right, this is why we want to look at all scriptures in context. <clears throat> what does the Bible say about this? Do we get a second chance? No. Here's as clear as day. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. I'm sorry, there's no fine print here. There's no fine print here that says you get a second chance. 
There's nothing here, like even if you read the preceding verses before this and the verses after this, there's nothing even in context that says, post-mortem, you had a second chance. You don't. This is it. <clears throat> so let's look at this. What are, what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the philosophical problems with universalism? As creatures made in the image of God, we are bestowed with freedom. Right? God is... Uh, God has given us freedom to make choices. That is what it means to be made in the image of God. And even God will not violate your freedom, even if you use that freedom to choose against him. Does that make sense? God is not going to override your freedom. Okay, so that's the first point. To be saved against your will would be a violation of your freedom. Just like C.S. Lewis says, there are two kinds of people. People who will say to God, thy will be done, and then in the end, people, uh, God will say to certain people, all right then, thy will be done. If you want a life without me, if you don't want me in your life, if you don't want to bend the knee to me, if you don't want to serve me, if you don't want to worship me, you can have that. That sort of existence is available for you. I'm afraid you won't like it. It's, it's, it's going to be a pretty horrible place. But you will get what you want. You won't have me at all. Okay, so God will, God will respect your freedom even when you rebel against him. The problem is when you rebel against him, it does not end well for you. Okay, so <clears throat> to be saved against your will would be a violation of your freedom. Think about that for a second. Okay, universalists say, well, you will be saved even involuntarily. Because that's what's good for you. God knows what's good for you. So you will even be saved against your will. How does that work? How do you get saved against your will? <clears throat> Imagine you lived your entire life hating God. You know, uh, Sean uh, mentioned in that video an atheist who recently passed away. You know who he was referring to? He's referring to Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens was one of the militant atheists of our time. He just passed away a few years ago. I remember that interview because I watched it on the BBC. He said, in the end, if I accidentally say something, something close to Jesus is Lord or something like that, I want you to assume that the cancer has reached my brain. That's why I'm saying that. So don't take my words seriously if I, if I say anything that sounds remotely close to a deathbed confession. Right? So, uh, God is not going to violate your freedom even in the afterlife, even when you choose against Him. Secondly, here's the thing. If you're going to be saved anyways, why does it matter how you live? Right? If you're going to be saved anyways, why does it matter how you live? Why pursue holiness? Why pursue righteousness? Why does the Bible give us all these commands? Do not, do not lust after women. Do not steal. Do not covet. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Give the shirt off your back. If somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek. There's, admission, there's admonitions. There's all kinds of counsel and advice and on and on and on. Why do we need any of that? If it doesn't matter how you live, and you're going to get saved anyways. Does that make sense? You see the problem with this view? Why should we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Why does the Bible mandate us to choose Christ? The decisions we make in this life matter. Otherwise, the Lord would not tell us that. Thirdly, <coughs> third philosophical problem, if this life doesn't matter... Why did Jesus come to earth and die? Think about that. Why did Jesus have to come? Why the gruesome cross? Why all that work? Why the incarnation? Why the atoning work of the cross? I think all of that was a waste. If your decisions and the choices you make in this life don't matter. Because you can live however you want. You can be a hedonist. You can live for pleasure. And you get a get out of jail free card at the end after death anyways. Just take it then. <coughs> you see what I mean? 
Jesus' death and atoning work on the cross would be completely useless if this doctrine were true. Lastly, the Great Commission, if all will be saved, why bother evangelizing? It's a waste of our time, right? Miss Betty, if universalism is true, Pastor Paul is out of a job. We don't need churches. We don't need ministries. We don't need counsel, biblical counselors. We don't need CR. We don't need any of this stuff if universalism is true. This is all a giant waste of time. Why are all our kids off in foreign countries evangelizing to the gospel? We should bring them back. It's a waste of time. Everybody's going to be saved anyways. You see the problem with this view. The whole Christian enterprise of evangelizing and living righteously and sanctification, everything goes down the drain. If you believe, you are going to be given a second opportunity and you will be saved sometimes even against your will. <clears throat> that is the problem with universalism. Any questions? Quick, before we move on to the next view. There's another view I want to discuss with you. Any questions about universalism? Okay. This next view is called uh, annihilationism. <clears throat> you know, it's a big word, right? Uh, annihilationism. You, know, you guys know the word annihilate? So that's, uh, this is the noun of that, annihilationism. <clears throat> this doctrine states that the wicked, as part of their final judgment, will be annihilated by God and thus will cease to exist. What does this mean? What this means is that basically the judgment that God gives on the wicked is to make them go poof. And basically just vanish. They just disappear into nothingness. <clears throat> they vanish out of existence. They cease to exist. That's what this means. I actually, uh, several years ago, uh, I was on a radio show in KKLA uh, FM uh, in Los Angeles, and I had a three-hour debate with a, an annihilationist. Uh, myself and a buddy of mine, we represented the traditional view, <clears throat> and uh, Chris Date and Glenn Peoples, they represented the annihilationist view. It was a three-hour debate on which of these two doctrines is more biblically accurate. Very, very fascinating conversation, but also a very tiring conversation because there's a lot of semantics. There's a lot of word games. There's a lot of twisted hermeneutics going on. And it was very, very exhausting having that conversation. But there are a lot of people who actually believe this. Annihilationism is a very popular view. Actually, even amongst, uh, even between universalism and annihilationism, annihilationism actually within the evangelical community is a stronger view. <clears throat> okay, so annihilationism is a doctrine that states that the wicked as part of their final judgment will be annihilated by God <clears throat> and thus will cease to exist so how does this work so one of the ways they think it works is that as soon as the wicked die their souls will be annihilated okay, so that's your first death you die and if you have not accepted Christ you just go poof and you vanish into nothingness the second way that you die, again, here's an, again an, another purgatorial view, right? The wicked may go into a temporary state of punishment, an intermediary state, uh, <clears throat> where they will suffer in hell, probably for a brief period of time. But in their final judgment, when their bodies are resurrected on Christ's return, then they will be finally annihilated from existence. So I call this the death row view. You guys know what death row is, right? So this is the death row view, if you want to call it that. All right? <clears throat> so what are some modern denominations that believe in some form of annihilationism? Seventh-day Adventists. You guys have heard of that group? Seventh-day Adventists and even Jehovah's Witnesses are annihilationists. Okay? They believe that the wicked will just be erased from existence. So what is the basis for the doctrine of annihilationism? Here's the first one. Does this sound familiar? It would be unloving of God to punish people with eternal torment. Do you notice the 
their gravitation toward the loving nature of God. You see how this keeps coming up? It would be unloving of God to punish people with eternal torment because it would be inconsistent with his nature. Secondly, they will argue that when an animal is sick or becomes useless for anything, we put them out of their misery. We don't torment them. That's the analogy they would use. And if that's how fallen humans treat animals, how much more mercifully would God treat human beings even though they are wicked and rebellious? So putting them out of their misery would be more merciful. You guys tracking their argument here? <clears throat> Another basis for their argument. They will argue, this is a little bit more of a sophisticated argument, they'll say that immortality or eternal life is a gift and reward only for those who choose Christ. Those who don't will simply go out of existence. Okay, so what they'll say is Christians, you guys, you, you uh, ECP people, eternal conscious torment people, you guys are believing uh, the Plato's view of immortality. You guys believe that the soul is immortal no matter what, whether it is holy or whether it is reprobate, Either way, it is, it, it'll exist eternally. And annihilationists will say that that platonic view was wrong. They'll say that immortality or eternality is a gift of God. And it is a gift given only to those who choose Christ. But if you don't choose Christ, you don't continue surviving anyways, you just go poof and you vanish. Do you understand their argument? Okay, that's what's happening over there, all right? I know, this is... <laughs> mind-boggling stuff, right? Uh, so let me show you some proof texts for annihilationism. Here's the first one they go to. Revelations chapter 20, verses 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. <clears throat> okay? Second death. Why does that matter? So their argument goes like this. They'll tell you, well, when you die the first time, what happens? There's a cessation of your consciousness. Right? You, you just lose consciousness when you die. When you die the second time eternally, you, your entire soul will cease to exist. So you see that there's kind of a fine line over there, okay? So they're drawing a direct parallel with your first death and saying, well, your second death is going to be parallel to your first death anyways. Second. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. The key word there is destruction. The way they argue destruction is not the way we would conventionally argue destruction. They equivocate the word destruction to mean annihilation. And I'm going to show you in a little bit why that's wrong. Okay? Here's a third passage, Psalm chapter 37, verses 20. But the wicked will perish... The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. <clears throat> Alright. How do we respond to these guys? Here's the counter response. In James chapter 2 verses 26, <clears throat> it says that when you die, your soul is separated from your body. Your soul doesn't cease to exist. Does that make sense? James chapter 2 verses 26 is clear. You look it up right now. You can see there's a separation of your soul and your body. Your soul doesn't just go poof and vanish. So this whole idea of second death it doesn't make sense. They want to say that just like when you're, when, after your first death, your consciousness goes poof. In your second death, your entire soul goes poof. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Bible teaches that even in the first step, your soul doesn't go poof, it just separates from your body. You continue to exist, your soul continues to exist even after that. Okay? Genesis chapter 3, what happens? When Adam and Eve sinned, scripture says that they died spiritually. They did not go out of existence. They were still there. They were still aware. They still felt guilt. They still felt shame. They didn't just vanish, right? They sinned. They immediately felt a spiritual disunity with God. But they were still very much there and alive. They did not go out of existence. 
Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 tells us we are dead in our trespasses and sins until we are saved. But we still exist. We're still image bearers, right? We don't go out of existence. We're still here. So biblically speaking, true life means a spiritual unity with God. That's the way we respond to this. True life doesn't mean just uh, biological life. It means a spiritual union with God. And so when scripture says that there is a second death, it's referring to a spiritual separation from God. Does that, does that make sense? A second death is not you going poof and vanishing out of existence. A second death is saying you are now irreversibly spiritually separated from God. And it's, it's death. The Bible calls that death. You are dead. I mean, if you want to call yourself alive because you're existing in hell, I suppose you can call it that, but the Bible calls that death. You're, you're a waste of a life. Your life actually has no value in hell. You might as well be dead. <clears throat> Next kind of response. Destruction does not necessarily mean annihilationism. It does not mean annihilation. So here's an analogy. If you go to a junkyard, you're going to find cars that are destroyed. Those cars still exist. You're going to find destroyed cars. You're not going to find annihilated cars, right? So what does destroyed mean? It means that these cars are not functioning the, the way they were originally meant to function. That's why they are destroyed. That's why they are useless. They're just sitting around in the junkyard, not working. They're not functioning the way they were meant to function. That's what we mean when we say destroyed. But destroy does not mean annihilate. And that's what they do. They, they use the word destruction and equivocate it with the word annihilation. All right? So the, the Hebrew word is abad. In several places in the Old Testament, the word abad is used not only to refer to things that are destroyed, but also to things that are broken or lost or useless or sold into slavery. The people of the tribe of Kamosh, I think, in one part of the Old Testament, this is the word that's, that's used to describe them. That this tribe is abad, this tribe is destroyed. Does it mean they vanished? No, it doesn't. They're still there. They were just sold into slavery. Their, their entire uh, lineage became useless. So the, the word abad can have a whole spectrum of meanings. Right? <clears throat> Here's the other thing. It is also a very odd use of language to use a continuing verb to something that has a finality about it. What do we mean by that? If what the annihilationists say about final destruction is true, why does scripture use the continuing verb everlasting? Right? If, if you go poof, it's done. It's over. It's finished. Why use, a, why use a word everlasting? Everlasting is a continuing process. Why would God use, why would Jesus use an everlasting term to an event that is supposedly over and done with? No, Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. When he used the word everlasting, aeon, in Greek, he said, it is a process that will continue forever and ever. It is not a term of finality, it is a term of continuous process. Right? <clears throat> the worm does not die. There's a reference there. There's an analogy there for you. What happens, okay, I, I, to, to, at the risk of sounding really graphic, when you look at maggots, maggots will live and eat as long as there is something to eat. Once they have finished eating, what happens? They're gone. They're dead. But what does scripture say? It says the worm does not die die. What does that mean? It means there is everlasting food for these maggots. They don't run out of food. Look at the other term. The other term used is fire is not quenched. How long can a fire stay alive? As long as there's oxygen, as long as there's fuel, fire needs all of these elements to stay burning. 
As soon as those elements run out, the fire dies. Scripture uses the term of fire being unquenchable. That means the fire rages on and on. Smoke rises forever. I had an interesting, I remember having this uh, argument with, uh, on that debate. I remember him saying, see, uh, Prashant, here's the thing. See, it says that the smoke is rising. So what does that mean? It means that the fire has done its, the fire has done its work. If something is burning, the, the smoke rises. That means it's burned, it's done. Yeah, but <coughs> it's saying smoke rises forever. Smoke keeps rising, which means what? Something is burning, it's continuing to burn. It's not done burning, it's continuing to burn. That's why it says the smoke rises forever and ever. Okay? So we have to pay attention to the words, we have to pay attention to the translations, we also have to pay attention to the metaphors that are being used in Scripture. These are not accidents. The Lord knew exactly what He was saying when He used these metaphors. And we need to pay attention to those metaphors. Okay? So, here's another one. <clears throat> they will say, uh, uh, the word everlast, oh, here's the thing. The annihilationists will argue that the Greek word aeonion, which generally means everlasting or without end, can also sometimes mean limited period. Now, here's the thing. They are right about that. The Greek word aeonion, when you actually see it in scripture, in some places it is used to denote a limited period of time. And so what they'll say is Matthew 25, when Jesus is saying, uh, these will go into everlasting punishment, aeon, destruction, what he's saying is that they will only go into a, a temporary period of suffering, and then they will vanish. What's the problem with this argument? You're only <coughs> referring to the second half of the verse. What is Jesus saying in the first half of the verse? The righteous will go to aeon. Eternal life with God. If you're going to use a word, a word in that sense, use it consistently. Because Jesus uses it twice in Matthew 25. You guys see what I'm saying? You see the argument there? Jesus is saying, he's saying the righteous will go into eternal life with God. The wicked will go into eternal punishment with God. If you're going to make the argument that Aeon in this sense means a limited time period, does that mean that even the righteous are going to have only a limited time period with God? You see the problem with this. You can't play around with language like that. You have to use the words consistently. This is a problem for the annihilationists. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16 is, is the final analogy I want to show you. Actually, it's not even an ana analogy. Uh, Jesus used a lot of parables to tell stories, to make his points. Uh, scholars will actually tell you that the Luke 16 passage of the rich man in hell uh, is actually not a parable. Because usually when Jesus talks about parables, he says there once was a man or there once was a woman. That's, that's usually how his parables start, right? Well, in this story, there are people with names. There's Lazarus. There's Abraham. And actually in the Latin Vulgate, the rich man has a name. His name is Dives. You won't find it in any of the other versions the translations of the Bible. But in the Latin Vulgate, you'll find his name. His name is Dives. So why is Jesus telling us a story with actual names in it? I think the most probable explanation is he's not telling us a parable. He's telling us an actual event. He's giving us a peek behind the cosmic curtain. Okay, you'll remember the story. The rich man uh, was very comfortable on earth. Lazarus was a beggar who was outside. And he was, you know, eating the scraps that were available. But after they died, Lazarus went to be comforted with Abraham. And the rich man went to hell. And then there was this conversation that this rich man is having with Abraham. And he's saying, could you send Lazarus down to dip his finger in some water and put it on my tongue? Because I can't bear the agony here. And there's this electrifying conversation between Abraham and the rich man. And the rich man is saying, well, can you at least let me go so I can warn my brothers? And what does Abraham say? No, you can't. There's a great chasm that divides the living from the dead. And then what does he say? He says, if, if your brothers didn't even believe Moses, they're not going to believe even if someone rises from the dead. So what's the point of the story? The point of the story is 
obviously the rich man is aware. He's conscious. He knows what is happening. He is in agony. He is having an ongoing conversation with Abraham. Can you have such a conversation and experience agony if you don't even exist? No, you can't. Luke 16 is an indictment against annihilationism. It is proof that annihilationism is, uh, annihilationism is not true. <clears throat> okay? Alright, so those are the alternative views. Okay, so that's universalism and annihilationism. Any quick questions about annihilationism before I kind of bring it back to the biblical doctrine of hell? <clears throat> I, listen, I know there's a, I know there was a, that's a lot. I feel like I'm fire hosing you guys, but we're running out of time really quickly, and I just want to make sure that I'm able to give you guys as much as possible because you will find other people out there, uh, people who, you know, uh, will say that yeah, I, I believe in all these other doctrines of Christianity, but when it comes to hell, this is what I believe. How are we going to respond to this? Okay, that's why I really felt like it's important for you guys to know that there are such alternative views to the doctrine of hell. There are scriptures that are used to defend these positions, and we have to know our way around these scriptures if we are to have any sort of legitimate conversation um, with these people. Okay, all right, let's take it back to the biblical doctrine of hell. Uh, I know we already looked through the passages, so we're not going to look at uh, we're not going to look at the theology of it or the hermeneutics of it. I actually want to discuss the philosophy of it, okay? There's a lot of objections even about the biblical doctrine of hell. Uh, after I had my uh, debate online, the host of the show accidentally put my email out there. Uh, and so I started getting these uh, crazy emails, not directly to my server, but to the, to the server of the radio show. And uh, he told me later that there were scores of people, Christians, who were mad with our group because we were talking about eternal conscious punishment. They were mad because we would believe such a horrible thing. They were mad that we would paint God in such a poor light that God enjoys roasting people in some sort of Auschwitz-like gas chamber in hell. They were mad. These are Christians. Okay? So, all that to say that there are people out there who will consider themselves your fellow brothers and sisters who have opposing views on this issue. And I want to equip you guys with that knowledge and with the resources to even be able to engage in a conversation with them. Okay, so if you're wondering why is he he's giving me a headache telling me all this stuff, no, this is why. This is why. All right? And given that this is a topic that people don't even like to talk about, that actually compounds the problem even more. So as believers, we need to pay attention to something that Jesus paid that much attention to. R.D. Were you surprised by that response? I was. I was. Uh, I was expecting uh, more pushback from atheists and skeptics. I was surprised to get more pushback from fellow brothers. Yeah, I was surprised. <clears throat> It could be. It could be. It's possible. It's hard to say uh, because especially when something is personal like that, um, people don't always directly express that because that would actually give away the weakness of their position. They cannot actually come out and say, I don't believe that because my so-and-so, uh, but they have to find other ways to circumvent that argument. So it, it's hard to say, but I think it's very possible. It's very possible that there are personal struggles involved here as well. Uh, actually, I think it's, uh, it is personal, actually, because who wants to believe in the biblical doctrine of hell? It sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? <laughs> who wants to believe it? Look, actually, I'll tell you this. I'll even go out of my way to tell you this. I wish universalism were true. In fact, 2 Timothy seems to say, hopefully this doesn't sound like heresy, it seems to say that God desires that all be saved. God desires that universalism is true. But it's not. All will not be saved. 
because there will be humans who will make a free choice to rebel and reject God. And God is a respecter of your free choice. He will give you what you ultimately ask for, even if you didn't ask for him. Okay? And that is the sad part of it. All right. We have uh, only about 20 minutes left. I'm going to get into the biblical doctrine of eternal conscious punishment. We're going to deal with some of the philosophy of it and the objections that come with that. And then we will close up. All right? Uh, so first of all, let's, I want to I wanna split this into three sections, all right? The, the term is called eternal conscious punishment. So we're going to actually break that down and actually look at it word by word. I actually don't <laughs> think we need to examine the term punishment. I think that would seem kind of obvious by now. I think that most human beings intuitively know that if you do something wrong, you deserve to be punished for it. Uh, I don't think anybody has a problem necessarily with uh, punishment in and of itself, I think a lot of people have a problem with the nature of the punishment, with the duration of the punishment. I think that's where the problem is. The problem with the, the, the objection to the view of eternal conscious punishment is that the doctrine of hell has to do more with the nature of the punishment, which is consciousness, and the duration of hell, which is eternality, the eternal nature of hell. Right? So let's examine those two then. Okay? Here's the question. Why is punishment conscious? Now it gets a little technical, okay, because we're dealing with some philosophy here, so I want you to pay attention carefully to the way I explain this. Look, punishment by definition must entail some degree of suffering. <coughs> Let me give you an example. If you jump a red light, you broke the law. What are you going to get? If you get caught, you're going to get a fine, right? What is a fine? It is a monetary form of suffering, right? You have, to, you have to give up some of your money for breaking the law. It is a form of suffering. Suffering doesn't necessarily mean torture, like you're strapped in Afghanistan in some chair and being waterboarded or something like that. Suffering can have all kinds of views to it. So when you have to pay a fine, that is a monetary form of suffering. Now, if you repeatedly commit traffic violations, what happens? You get your driver's license taken away. That is another form of suffering. You don't have the freedom to drive in society anymore. And if you commit a more serious crime, then you're put in jail. That is another form of suffering, which means you now lose the privilege to live as a free human being in society. Does that make sense? So punishment, by definition, must entail some degree of suffering. However, suffering requires self-awareness. You guys with me? Suffering requires self-awareness. <clears throat> self-awareness means that you recognize that you are being punished, you understand why you are being punished, and lastly, the acknowledgement that this punishment is fully deserved. Okay? That's what we mean when we say the self-awareness of your punishment. So punishment by, by definition must entail some degree of suffering. Suffering requires self-awareness. Now, stay with me. Self-awareness requires consciousness. You cannot be self-aware if you're not conscious, right? If you're not conscious, so this is the logic. Here's the logic. I actually put it in a, in a diagram for you. Punishment, by definition, requires suffering. In order to suffer, you need to have self-awareness. But in order to have self-awareness, you need to be conscious. If you don't have consciousness, you cannot be self-aware. If you're not self-aware, you cannot suffer. If you don't suffer, that is not punishment. Does that make sense? This is an indictment against annihilationism. Because annihilationism says... You lose consciousness. Well, if you lose consciousness, then you're not self-aware. You cannot be self-aware. And if you cannot be self-aware, you cannot suffer. And if you cannot suffer, that's not punishment. So annihilationists are philosophically wrong to say that the extinguishing of your consciousness is punishment. It cannot be punishment if you don't even exist. Does that make sense? You guys understand what I, where I'm going with this? All right? So that is the logical progression of that. Okay? This is why 
the annihilationist version of punishment is actually a perversion of justice. It is not true justice. So a person may live as wickedly as they want, and at the end, they will just magically vanish from existence. Is that justice? Imagine somebody came, some guy came and committed a, a horrible crime against our child. And then the cops come, and they're like, okay, let's put you under. You slap a, a thing on him, and he just loses consciousness and goes away. And they're like, okay, justice has been served. Would you feel like justice has been served as a parent? No. I think he actually got away. He escaped justice, right? Look, as someone from India, I'm very aware of Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism. When you actually study all of these views, all of these views have, you know, so for example, there's this view called karma, right? You're stuck in this karmic cycle. You don't have a way to get out of it. You don't have any gauge to tell you if you're improving or getting worse. So you know what all of these religions desire? What is their ultimate goal? is to lose their consciousness. That is when they feel like they've achieved true salvation, is when they cease to exist and they become one with nothingness. You remember we did our class on pantheism over here. We talked about some of this stuff. This is what annihilationism is trying to tell you. How is this punishment? Even the Eastern religions know that this is a liberation from punishment. For you to lose your consciousness is not to experience punishment, it's to escape punishment. Okay? In Revelations 9, the Bible talks about this. In Revelations 9, it says that the wicked will beg to die, but death will elude them. I don't remember the verse off the top of my head, but you can, you can check it out when you go home tonight, tonight in Revelations chapter 9. The wicked will beg to die, but death will elude them. What happens when you are being punished, when the fury of God is raining down on you, when you're experiencing that kind of wrath, you don't want to exist. You wish you could die. But death will not be available to them. So I think it's fundamentally wrong to say that if a, if a person ceases to exist, if they lose their consciousness, that is actually a form of punishment. No, that's not punishment. That's an escape from punishment. Okay? <clears throat> Annihilationism is not punishment, but rather an escape from punishment. And finally, I want to end with this. Why is, this is the most difficult part. Okay, this is probably the greatest pushback you will get against the biblical doctrine of hell has to do with this question. Why is punishment eternal? This is the ultimate objection against hell. Why is punishment eternal? Everyone will say, even if a person, people will say, even if a person sinned for every second of their life and then died, eternal hell is too harsh of a punishment. Okay? You sort of get it. I would say it's not, it's not an irrational argument. It's a rational argument. Even if you sin every second of your life, how is it fair that you are punished eternally? I think it's a fair argument. But there's, there's something they're missing when they make that argument in this context. And I'm going to show you why. At the heart of this logic is this idea. That the punishment should be directly proportional to the time it took to commit the crime. That's the fundamental idea here, right? That's why people think that this is unfair. Wait a minute, even if I sinned every second of my life, how is it Fair that I'm punished for eternity. Underlying that argument is this logic, that the punishment should be directly proportional to the time it took to commit the crime. Here is why this logic is fundamentally wrong. Let me give you an example to show you. Imagine if somebody uh, robbed your house. Okay, You're on vacation, they come to your home, they rob your house, nobody's at home, so they take their own sweet time. They take two hours. To rob your home. <clears throat> okay? That's one scenario. Scenario B, they come to rob your home, but you happen to be there, and they kill you. It takes them two seconds to kill you. So in the one sense, it's taken them two hours to rob you. In the other sense, it's taken them two seconds to kill you. If this went to court, which crime is considered the more serious crime, robbery or murder? 
Margaret, why? It took only two seconds to commit it. Because murder is a crime committed against the dignity and life of a person. In robbery, you're just stealing something that belongs to someone. There's no direct harm to that person. Okay, that's why it doesn't matter whether he took two hours to rob your house. The fact of the matter is, it took him two seconds to kill you, but this is a more serious crime because it was committed against a person. Okay? So, um, the early church father, Anselm, actually put it this way. I think this is the right logic. The magnitude of the punishment must be directly proportional to the sovereignty of the offended party. The magnitude of the punishment should be directly proportional to the sovereignty of the offended party. Let's, let's do a metaphor for that. Okay, if I go out and I walk into Casey's and somebody's checking me out over there, and if I punch the person who's checking me out, is that a crime? Yes, it is. It's assault, isn't it? Okay, and I'm going to get some kind of punishment for that, whatever that is. Now, what if I punch the, the governor of Iowa? Is that a crime? Yes, it is. Do you think I'm going to get a slightly higher punishment for it? Of course I am. Now, what if I punished, or what if I punched the president? It's over. I'm toast. It's a federal offense. Now, here's the question. In all three of these situations, the criminal is the same. The crime is the same. It's a punch. It's an assault. Why is the punishment different in all three of these situations? Because of the authority and the sovereignty of the party against whom I committed the crime. Now, given human beings only have delegated authority, okay? So that person who's checking me out at the counter has a delegated authority. The governor of Iowa has delegated authority. The president has delegated authority. But the punishment varies because of the, the, the level of authority of each of those people, even though the crime was exactly the same. If we intuitively understand this as human beings, how much more should the punishment be if we commit cosmic treason and rebellion against an holy, righteous, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal God? By definition, your, your punishment should be eternal. Does that make sense? By definition, your punishment should be eternal. When you commit a crime against an eternal being, by definition, your punishment will also be eternal. Because the magnitude of the punishment is directly proportional to the sovereignty of the offended party. This is why rebellion <clears throat> against an eternal being warrants eternal punishment. This, there is a certain rationality to hell, I must admit. There is a certain rationality to hell. I think emotionally this is a difficult doctrine to deal with. But when you, when you commit a crime against a holy, righteous God, then this punishment is the most appropriate punishment to come your way. So it doesn't matter how long it took you to, to uh, accrue all these sins. What matters is, who did you commit the sin against? You committed the sin against a most perfect, most holy being. A being, by the way, God is not a being for whom his authority is delegated to him. He has intrinsic authority. He doesn't have delegated authority. There's nothing above him. There's nothing outside of him that gave him authority. He is the ultimate benchmark for authority. This is a, this is a, this is a Ford, uh, some truck commercial I saw the, the other day saying, for the, for the F-150, it says the F-150 doesn't raise the bar, it is the bar. Have you guys seen that commercial? Well, God is the bar for authority. He is the authority. There's nothing above him. Okay? Revelation 16 also describes how people will respond when God's wrath is poured upon the earth as judgment. It repeatedly says that they will refuse to repent and curse against God for his judgment against them. If that is how they're going to be when the wrath of God is poured upon them on earth, why should we think anything's going to be different in hell? Now it says that eventually at the end, every knee will bow and confess. So Christopher Hitchens right now, who lived his entire life believing that there is no God, now believes there is a God. 
He is alive now in a horrible, horrible existence. And now he does bend the knee, but not out of worship. He bends the knee because he doesn't have a choice. He has to bend the knee against the living God. Does that make sense? Now there is no way for him to argue there is no God because he is right there. And he is under that, God, that God's judgment. Okay? I want to end with this. Hell is a horrible place. And when we think about, you know, we, we looked at all the characteristics of hell, the worms, the maggots, the unquenchable fire, the, the living with shame and contempt and guilt forever and ever, and the blackest darkness and all of that stuff. It's horrible. <clears throat> and when people think of that, there's, sometimes when skeptics ask the question, they, they want to ask, well, this is terrible. How could something like this exist? Why can't God just forgive everybody? Why can't he just wipe away their sins? Why can't he make a way to just erase everything so we don't have to deal with any of this? And your response should be, ladies and gentlemen, he did on the cross of Calvary. He did make a way on the cross of Calvary. There is one event in history that was done precisely so that you will not have to endure the horrors of hell. The only thing God asks of you is to submit to him, give your life to him, give your allegiance to Jesus, and you will have eternal life with him and avoid the horror of hell. John chapter 3, verse 16, the most possibly the most famous passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did make a way for us. That was 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. I want to encourage you all <clears throat> that hell is not a doctrine we should take lightly. Just like my professor said, every morning when I wake up, I realize the sobering reality that somewhere, someone in the world, somewhere in the world, is going to be eternally separated from God. Even God doesn't desire that. Second Timothy, I believe, he says he desires all be saved. Okay? That's why we have to be a light to the world. We have to be a salt of the earth. We have to be the shining light of Christ to the dark world around us because there is a darkness that is worse than the darkness that they're experiencing now. That is the outer darkness, the blackest darkness where there is no coming back. And we don't want that. And keep in mind, if you need a, if you need, if you need a more stronger incentive, keep in mind, for a lot of people in this room, that may be someone you love. That may be someone you love. Okay, so let me end with that. I'm so grateful and thankful that there is the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that we as believers are united with him. We have a spiritual unity with him. And we do not have to perish. But we will have eternal life with God. But there are scores of people out there who do not know that. And we cannot be different about that. Okay? Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord. And what a sobering topic to talk about. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the, the horror that you endured. You, Jesus, were separated from your Father for a moment there on the cross. And how horrible that was for you, Lord. You said, you said on the cross, Elahi, Elahi, Lama Samachthani, why, Father, have you forsaken me? Lord, we know that that had to happen so that we would not be eternally forsaken. We thank you, God, for that incredible sacrifice that you made on the cross. We know that even now, as we sit here as believers, as recipients of the grace and the blessing that we have through the cross, there are scores, multitudes of people out there who are marching toward the edge of a cliff, and they don't even know what happens when they go over. God, we pray that you will use our lives as a testament, that we will use our lives responsibly to speak the truth to a dying culture out there, God. Lord, we want to be a people who say to you, thy will be done. 
help us to be that kind of people tonight, God. And once again, we just want to thank you for the glory of your cross and for what you have saved us from. We will never understand the magnitude, the significance of the good news unless we first realize the magnitude of the bad news. We thank you, Father, and tonight as we part ways, we pray that you will continue to be with all of us uh, until we come back here two weeks from now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.